Hello, my name is Rachel. I'm also known as Vintage Gold Muse. As Vintage Gold Muse, I play a series of folk songs, folk music, uh, great for any occasion. Today, I am Rachel. As Rachel, I am bringing you some Jewish music. I will bring you my original music, which is the Psalms sung in Hebrew, and I will be sharing with you bits and pieces of Jewish, Hasidic, and other wisdom that's been collected from Chabad, Labovitch, and from stories that have circulated, you probably got them too, on the internet, and just little pieces of wisdom that uh, I feel go along with the Psalms that I'll be singing. However, the first song is not a Psalm, it's called Lachash Al Hayam. Are you a god? They asked the Buddha. No, he said. Are you an angel then? No. A saint? No. Then what are you? Replied the Buddha. I am awake. Dot al hachof vata omer vegalim galim shel hayam vata ata bodet ata choshev. Translation to that song took me 20 years to, to do. It essentially says, migrant gulls are speckling, speckled on the shoreline and you are there. The waves, they come and they go and you are there. 
thinking the thoughts of the day you want to run, run away. The wind whispers a message that you don't hear. Clouds changing their faces and you depart while the sea gathers her treasures as you turn away. According to Jewish tradition, Abraham, also known originally as Avram or Avraham, was born under the name Avram in the city of Ur in Babylonia in the year 1948 from creation, which is also the year 1800 BCE. He was the son of Terach, an idol merchant, but from his early childhood he questioned the faith of his father. He came to believe that the entire universe was the work of a single creator, and he began to teach this belief to others. Shema is a very important prayer, perhaps the most important prayer in Judaism. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. It's the prayer that proclaims that there is only one God, probably for all the nations. But back in those days, that was a truly novel concept in a time when most people were worshiping idols. And that novel concept caused a difference, caused Avraham and his followers to be different. Perhaps today we still have much to learn about differences and progressing and progress in order to try and come to a place of peace. Hashem, Hashem Echad, Hashem Echad, Hashem, Hashem, Hashem Echad, Hashem. Hashem 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 Echad 
There's a story that circulated on the web, very beautiful story. It was called Lunch with God. I've got it here. There once was a little boy who wanted to meet God. He knew it was a long trip where God lived, so he packed his suitcase with Twinkies and a six-pack of root beer, and he started his journey. When he had gone only a few blocks from home, he met an old woman. She was sitting in the park near the water, just staring at some birds. In the original story, which was, uh, by the way, from Chicken Soup for the Veteran Soul, this was a man, but I liked it. When I got it, it was a woman. The boy sat down next to her and opened his suitcase. He was about to take a drink from his root beer when he noticed that the old woman looked hungry. So he offered her a Twinkie. The old woman gratefully accepted, and she smiled at him. Her smile was so incredible that the boy wanted to see it again. So he offered her a root beer. Once again, she smiled at him. The boy was delighted. They sat there all afternoon eating and smiling, but they never said a word. As it grew dark, the boy realized how tired he was, and he got up to leave. But before he'd gone on more than a few steps, he turned right around and ran back to the woman and gave her a big hug. The old woman gave him the biggest smile ever, as I say to the kids, an ear to ear. When the boy opened the door to his own house a short time later, his mother was surprised by the look on him of joy on his face. She asked her son, what did you do today that made you so happy? The child replied, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could respond, he added, you know what? She's got the most beautiful smile I have ever seen. Meanwhile, the old woman, also radiant with joy, returned to her home. Her son was stunned by the look of peace on her face, and he asked her, What did you do today that made you so happy? She replied, I ate Twinkies in the park with God. But before his son responded, she added, You know, he's, he's much younger than I expected. From that, I go to a psalm. This is Psalm 32, verse 11. And uh, original music is mine. This is called Simchu Vaadoshem, Vigilu Tzadikim Vaharninu Kol Yishrei Lev. Rejoice in God, exalt righteous ones, shout for joy, all of you who are, ho who are upright in the heart. John, I'm going to sing it three times. So if you want to sing it with me, please do. Simchu v'adoshem v'gilu tzadikim v'harninu kol kol yeshrelev Simchu Harninu kol Yisraelev Simachu v'adoshem v'gilu tzadikim v'harninu kol kol Yisraelev Simachu v'adoshem v'gilu tzadikim v'harninu kol Who 
בהר נינו כל, כל ישרי לב, שמחו ודושם, וגילו צדיקים, בהר נינו I'm telling you great stories today, collections from all sorts of wise people from wise places. This next story is a bit long. From the uh, Chabad organization, the Chabad uh, website, it's called Shlomo's Scales. It was by uh, a man named Tuvia Tills. Sorry. Tuvia Bolton. Got to give credit where credit is due. December 1700. It was a cold winter in Poland, and a blanket of snow covered the entire country. The city streets were filled with people bundled up in fur coats, and the countryside peasants were busy warming their homes with wood and themselves with vodka. The holiday season was approaching, and everybody was in good spirits. But in the Jewish ghetto in Krakow, Gloom and fear filled the air and moaned from every corner. Persecuted by poverty and hate, the Jews of Krakow had but one source of worldly joy, and that too was being taken from them. The children were dying of smallpox. It was the beginning of the epidemic. The doctors were helpless to stop it, and the various home remedies did nothing. Every day the town was visited with more heartbreaking tragedies, the only one they could turn to, as usual, was God in heaven. And God didn't seem to be listening to their prayers. The rabbi of the community had declared a fast day, then another, and then three days of prayer and self-examination, but nothing seemed to work. A week of supplication was announced, but before it began, the elders of the community decided to make a sha'alat chalom, which is a dream query employed by the masters of the secret wisdom of the Kabbalah. It was a drastic move, but they felt they had no other choice. They purified themselves, they fasted, they recited psalms all day, immersed in a mikvah, in a ritual cleansing, and then requested from God, according to the ancient Kabbalistic formulas that they had been given, that they should be given some sort of sign that, n that night when they slept. And that night, they all had the same dream. An old man in a white robe appeared and said, Shlomo, the butcher, should pray before the entire congregation. Early the next morning, they met in shul in the synagogue and related their dream to each other. 
It was clear now what they had to do. The 20 of them solemnly walked to Shlomo's home and knocked on the door. When his wife opened, she almost fainted at the sight of them. Yes, she stammered, pushing her loose hair under her kerchief on her head. We want to speak to your husband. Is he home? said one of them, smiling and trying to be as pleasant as possible. May we come in? asked another. Shlomo came to the door, invited them all in, shook everyone's hand, ran around looking for chairs, and when they were finally all seated, one of them began. Shlomo, we made a shalat halom, a dream query, yesterday. We asked about what to do about the epidemic, and we all had the same dream. We dreamed that you have to lead the prayers today. Shlomo was dumb to, dumbfounded, obviously. If it weren't such a serious matter, he would have thought that this was some kind of a joke. I should lead the prayers? Uh, why, I, 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 can, I can't even read properly. I can't, I mean, what good will it possibly do? Shlomo, the elders begged, just come and do what you can. You don't have to really lead. Just pray in front of everyone. Maybe there'll be a miracle. Just come and give it a try. We've summoned everyone to the shul. Just come and say a few words. Anything is better than what we have now. So Shlomo, with no other choice, left his house and accompanied them. But as soon as they entered the crowded synagogue and closed the doors behind them, Shlomo suddenly broke away ran back outside and down the street and out of sight. What could he do? He disappeared. They didn't even know where to look for him. They had no choice other than to wait. A few minutes later, the door opened, and in came Shlomo, pushing a wheelbarrow covered with a cloth. All eyes were on him as he went up to the podium, pulled off the cloth, and lifted an old set of scales out of the barrow. He'd brought his butchered scales into the shul. The scales were very heavy, but Shlomo lifted them high, high, high above his head. His face contorted with every effort, tears streaming from his eyes. Suspense is killing you, right? <laughs> Here, he yelled at the ceiling. Here, God, take them. Take the scales. That must be why you want me to lead the prayers, right? So take the scales and heal the children. Just heal the children, okay? By now, Shlomo was sobbing loudly, and the whole place was dead silent. A few men rushed over, helped him put the scales on the table in front of the room, and the congregation began the prayers. That evening, the children were already getting better. You can imagine the joy and festivities that followed. They even made a nice glass case for the scales and left the whole thing there permanently for all to see. But after a few days, when the excitement died down, the elders had to admit that they couldn't figure it out. After all, there were tens of shops that used scales in the ghetto, and all of them were owned by honest, God-fearing Jews. What could be so special about Shlomo's scales? The answer was soon in coming. When they went around checking all the other scales, they discovered that every one of them, without exception, was a bit off. Certainly, never enough to constitute bad business but inaccurate nevertheless. It seems that Shlomo checked his scales twice every day while the others checked only occasionally. That's what God wants, Shlomo explained. And legend has it 
that these scales remained on display in that Krakow synagogue over 200 years until the Germans destroyed everything in World War II. This is Psalm 41, verse number 2. Ashrei maskil. Happy is the one. Happy is the one who tends to the needy. On that day, God will rescue her. Continue with Psalm 41, verses 13 and 14. Amen. Ba 
אני בתומי, תמכת בי, תמכת בי. ואתה ציווני לפניך, לפניך לעולם. ברוך השם אלוקי ישראל מהעולם, בעד העולם, אמן ואמן, אמן ואמן, אמן ואמן, אמן ואמן, אמן ואמן, אמן ואמן. means you will support me because of my integrity. You will let me abide in your presence forever. Blessed is God, God of Israel, from now and forever. Amen. Which brings us to another story. Sorry for flipping the pages, but here it is. <laughs> you know, at this age... The memory doesn't kick in as well. Anyway, this is Anshel Rothschild's secret room, as told by Yitzchak Cohen, also from the Chabad collection. Everyone has heard of the famous wealthy banking family, the Rothschilds. If you haven't, here's your chance. The founding father of the Rothschild clan was Anshel Rothschild. He was an Orthodox Jew who lived in the middle of the 19th century in Austria. He had amassed a huge fortune and established a close relationship with the then emperor of Austria, Franz Joseph. From time to time, the emperor would send visitors to the luxurious and famous palace of Anshel Rothschild. It was the most lavish, luxurious, and well-appointed palace in all of Austria and everyone wanted to see the beauty and the wealth. During one visit, Anshel took his guest, an important government official, by the way, on a tour of the palace. He showed him room after room, and the guest was awed by the beauty of the gold, the silver, the furnishings, the chandeliers, the imported fabrics. Everything was a sight to behold. There existed none like this in all of Austria. When Anshel passed a certain door, he continued walking, but the guest asked to be shown the room behind the door. I'm very sorry, Anshel said. This is the one room in the palace that I cannot show you. Why not? asked the guest. I would love to see every part of your remarkable palace. I simply cannot answered Anshel, and continued walking. The tour concluded, and the official returned to his master and reported everything he saw. The palace was even more than one could imagine. However, said the official to the emperor, there was one room that Anshel refused to show me. Why not? asked the emperor. I do not know but I can guess. You know how wealthy those Jews are. My theory is that there's a room that in there there is magic and there's a magic money-making machine. That's why he's so wealthy. Behind that door must be a machine that creates the wealth of Anshel Rothschild. The emperor didn't know whether to believe this official, so he sent a second government official to see the palace of Anshel Rothschild. The second official came back with the same story, and then he sent a third, and then he sent a fourth. The curiosity of Emperor Franz Joseph was greatly aroused, so he decided to go for himself and visit the palace. Anshel took the emperor for the same tour as he did all the other visitors from Franz Joseph's government, and when they reached the forbidden room, the emperor asked to go inside and see what was there. Anshel explained, as he did with the others, that that was the one place he could not show anyone. 
After the emperor insisted, Anshul gave in and agreed to show the emperor the secret room. He took out his keys, he opened the door, and invited the emperor to enter. Franz Joseph looked and was amazed at what he saw. There, in the small room, was a simple pine box and some plain white cloth on the table. That was all there was. What's this all about, said the emperor. Anshul explained, we Jews have strict rules about burial customs. When a person dies, he must be buried in a very simple coffin, a plain pine box, and his body must be enveloped in a plain white shroud. This is to maintain the equality of all God's creatures. No one is permitted to be buried in a fancy, expensive coffin or in luxurious clothing. Though some may live affluent lives and others may suffer dire, abject poverty in death, they are all equal. But why is this here in this room? Asked the emperor, impressed but still confused. At the end of each day, I come to this room and I view that coffin and the shrouds, and I'm reminded that even though I have great wealth and power, and I have important influence in the highest echelons of the Austrian Empire, I am still one of God's simple creatures. And at the end of my life, this is the end that I will come to, just like all of God's other children. I do this lest after a day filled with high finance and major financial transactions, lest I think too highly of myself and develop a bloated sense of myself. Franz Joseph was amazed and in fact he was speechless. His respect for Anshul Rothschild grew even greater than before. He never questioned the sincerity, honesty, or integrity of Anshul again. And we hope of all the Jews too. <coughs> Psalm 42, verses 3 and 5. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Sorry, excuse me, I've got to do something. Here we go, change picks. I, 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 I,
fun to let loose every now and then. I do have a few more songs for you and a few more stories. This next story is actually, uh, it, it came around on the internet and I researched it to find who wrote it. The person who wrote it is called Limin Hong. Was found on a poetry uh, site. It's called Two Boxes. I'm just gonna take a drink. Looks like vodka, but it's water. <coughs> I have in my hands two boxes that God gave me to hold. He said, God said, put all your sorrows in the black and all your joys in the gold. I heeded God's words and in the two boxes, both my joys and sorrows I stored. But though the gold became heavier each day, the black was as light as before. With curiosity, I opened the black. I wanted to find out why. And I saw in the base of the box a hole my sorrows had fallen out by. I showed the hole to God and mused aloud. I wonder where my sorrows could be. God smiled a gentle smile at me. My child, they're all here with me. I asked God. Why give me the boxes? Why the gold and the black with the hole? My child, God said, the gold is for you to count your blessings. The black is for you to let go. Hello, 
my voice to God and cry out. I lift my voice to God and God turns his ears and listens and hears. I have a few more songs. Actually, uh, three. Okay. Uh, these are short songs. And short stories. <laughs> but I'm going to skip this uh, story right now. All right, since time is running short, I'm going to play this song. And this song is simply, I'm going to sing it in Hebrew and English, so you will hear both. And by the way, again, I'm Rachel. My website is www.rachelmusic.net, R-A-H-E-L music.net. You can also find me at Vintage Gold Muse for folk music, which is not, it combines some of this Jewish folk music and general folk music in English, vintagegoldmuse.com. And I have uh, lots of CDs there. The one I'm singing from where all these songs can be found is called Tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N. And it can be fo found uh, at CD Baby. And also there's a website, tikkunrachel.com, T-I-K-K-U-N-R-A-H-E-L.com. So if you want to purchase this music or even just listen to it, you don't even have to purchase it. Or if you want to, you can download one song that you like. Just go to the websites and uh, click on the songs and you'll be able to do that. <laughs> Thank Jeff Dearman and the staff here at the Music Closet for making this all possible. This is the second time I'm appearing here, which is wonderful, and I thank you, Jeff, and all of you out there in the
very famous song called Babylon. This is my version of it. Al-Naharot Pavel, Al-Naharot Pavel, Al-Naharot Pavel. Sham Yashavnu, Sham Yashavnu, Sham Yashavnu, Kambachi. Bezachreinu, 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 Bezachreinu et Zio. me here. I'm going to sing you one last song. To complete the day. <laughs> Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov lived from 1698 to 1760. He was the founder of the Hasidic movement. He once asked, why is it that Hasidim burst into song and dance at the slightest provocation? Is this the behavior of a healthy, sane individual? The Baal Shem Tov responded with a story. Once a musician came to town, a musician of great but unknown talent. He stood on the street corner and began to play. Those who stopped to listen couldn't tear themselves away, and soon a large crowd enthralled by the glorious music whose equal they had never heard. Before long, they were moving to its rhythm, and the entire street was transformed into a dancing mass of humanity. A deaf man walked by and wondered, has the world gone mad? Why are the townspeople jumping up and down, waving their arms and turning in circles in the middle of the street? Hasidim, concluded the Baal Shem Tov, are moved by the melody that issues forth from every creature in God's creation. If this makes them appear mad to those with less sensitive ears, should they therefore cease to dance? Thank you again. This is Hallelujah, Psalm 150. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
hallelujah. Hear all good law, hallelujah. And take a shofar, hallelujah. And never be chinor, hallelujah. And mini be uga, hallelujah. It's just like shama, hallelujah. It's just like true. Thank you. I'm Rachel. Good night.